This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Viewer discretion is advised. Twenty free down, just one more series to go, folks. Let's do this. In 2019, it was confirmed by Jamfield Productions that they would no longer be animating for Thomas and Friends following series 24, which left a lot of fans wondering, was the show being cancelled altogether, or was it going on hiatus so Mattel could find a new animation company? At the time, we didn't know if there would be a series 25, but... Let's just say there's a reason I'm ending this marathon with series 24, unless they just somehow decide to revert to using CGI again. Though it's very likely that even if they did, by that point, all have retired from doing reviews on Thomas, lost interest in doing so altogether, or YouTube gets taken over by another internet overlord. Hey, anything could happen. You know, it seemed like yesterday when a lot of us thought that 2016 would be one of the worst years in modern human history since 1968. <laughs> Serious? Oh boy. Yeah, 2016 is not looking so bad now, is it? I probably don't need to say it, but 2020 was a complete shit show of a year. I'm not the first person to say that 2020 was the worst year in human history, nor will I be the last to say it. Obviously, there's the COVID-19 pandemic, which doesn't seem to be going away for a while yet, but then we've also got the death of Black Panther, President Biff barely doing his job at all, the George Floyd protests, people getting angry at each other over their beliefs, and even more exposing themselves as awful people, cancel culture getting out of hand over the most minor things, Alex Trebek ending up in an eternal hell of Sean Connery, the mere existence of pony life, the list goes on and on. Some even went as far as to say that 2020 was... The end of the fucking world. Yeah, that sounds about right. And it was no better for the Thomas fandom at all. 2020 marked the 75th anniversary of the franchise. While it did have some good things about it, on the whole, it was a very underwhelming celebratory year for Thomas and friends. The 50th anniversary had a book to celebrate the occasion as well as Series 4 and a documentary. The 60th anniversary had Calling All Engines along with Series 9 and probably a couple of things I'm forgetting. Even the 65th anniversary had Series 13 and 14 as well as Misty Island Rescue. And when I say anything about the 65th anniversary being a better year for Thomas, you know that's a bad sign. And as for the 70th anniversary, I wouldn't even know where to begin. So what did the 75th anniversary have to offer? We did get a 22 minute love letter known as Thomas and the Royal Engine and Series 24, one that's merely good but it still doesn't compare to Series 21 or even Series 2. There was the 20th anniversary Blu-ray release of Thomas and the Magic Railroad which... I'll save my thoughts on that movie for another day. And of course, there's the death of Michelangelis, one of the worst cases of party pooping since 1989. So yeah, this is kind of a sad way to end this marathon. Not on a bang, but a bit of a whimper. For series 24, the Big Old Big Adventures format seemed to have loosened its grip. For example, there's a reduction in fantasy sequences, allowing more room for storytelling, which honestly took me by surprise, but also a relief, as having a fantasy sequence in every episode can get tedious after a while. If we count the 22 minute episodes, 13 out of the 23 episodes for this season did not include a fantasy sequence whatsoever. Another noteworthy change was that there was no longer an even split between Sodor stories and international stories. There were only five episodes taking place away from Sodor, one per country with Brazil, India, Italy, Australia, and China. The last of them, Young Bao and the Tiger, was adapted from a China exclusive short of the same name attached to the Great Race, and it pretty much ended the international episodes on a high note, even going full circle with them. After all, the first episode away from Sodor took place in China. Mercia and Marcio, the Brazilian tender engines, make their sole appearance in Thomas and the Forest engines. They're not characters I would call top favorites, but they are Bash and Dash done better for sure. They've long to go beyond the Eucalyptus Railway, but limited resources show why they were better off at home. Here's a great lesson that I don't think the show has ever taught before. It's good to try new things, but don't feel ashamed if you're more comfortable at home. If it was an international episode that I would say was bad, it's Ace's brave jump. Thomas and Ace, after departing on sour terms in Big World Big Adventures, are suddenly chumming with each other once again with no explanation. Like, did I miss something from Series 22? Imagine if Starlight Glimmer made her grand return after the cutie map, and all of a sudden, she's part of Twilight Sparkle's friendship circle as opposed to them. Say what you will about the cutie remark, but at least we actually saw her become friends again with the main six. 
And speaking of redemptions, let's move on to Marvelous Machinery. I'm not gonna lie, it was a pretty boring duology overall. A new arrival just served as a setup to World of Tomorrow, just about nothing happened save for Sonny's subplot. More on that in a bit. It also introduces us to Roof. No, not the Scarlowy Railway Coach. This Roof was a human inventor. Roof's positive attitude is something to be appreciated. When Thomas and the Inventor's Workshop was accidentally leaked in March 2020 along with James the Super Engine, your guess is as good as mine as to how that happened, she didn't leave much of an impression. But it was during the clear episodes where Roof really shone as a character by making her a motherly figure to the road engine. Clea is such an adorable character, but it's pretty laughable that fans say her design is unrealistic, yet Diesel 10 is so lauded. But of course, anything by Mattel is Devil Incarnate despite the fact that they produce some of the best content since 1995. Okay, I don't think fans are outright saying that, but going by some attitudes, you'd be easily forgiven for thinking that. Anyway, back to Marvelous Machinery, and on to the second half, World of Tomorrow. It was the better of the two halves, but not by a whole lot. And Sonny's character arc really shone there, especially given that it's a redemption arc done right. Take notes, Hasbro. Rather than having everybody forgive him because... The ending demands it. A few engines like Thomas are willing to accept him while everyone else like Gordon thinks Sonny may be up to no good. Despite that he is no longer being abused and controlled by Baz and Bernie, Sonny was never cruel of his own volition. He just wanted to be really useful. Unfortunately, I have little to say regarding Kenji the Bullet Train. He was very much a plot device for the climactic chase scene, and his sole leading role, Kenji on the rails again, didn't do him a whole lot of justice either. In fact, Kenji ends up on a ship with Hiro back to Japan, and that's it. If you thought Henry's departure from Tidmouth in Forever and Ever was rushed, this is that only amplified, and it makes you wonder why on earth it took Hiro 9 series before he finally decided to return home again. So yeah, on the whole, Marvelous Machinery was a boring mess with unbalanced focus. That being said, this is probably one of the highlights from the duology. I would say, oh, the indignity, but it seems a bit of an understatement. <laughs> yeah, that moment is really funny, isn't it? And now we come to the series finale, Thomas and the Royal Engine. Yes, I know that it aired first in May 2020, while the rest started airing in September that same year, but chronologically, it is the final episode of the series as we knew it since 1984, so there. Anyway, they couldn't have picked a better way to bring the show to a close. This is 75 years in the making, not some childish reboot that tries and fails to claim that title. The story is very wholesome and simple, much like the franchise itself, and it teaches a great lesson in helping others in need. I don't know what else I can say that hasn't been said already. Thomas and the Rail Engine is that great. Also, having Sharon Miller voice the Queen of England herself feels like a massive take bad towards the fans who hated on her for a decade. Whoever came up with that is an evil genius and I love him for it. Speaking of the royal family, we got an introduction sequence fearing Harry, Duke of Sussex. Bert Alcroft herself criticized the marketing behind it, which... I don't get it all. It also seems a bit ironic since she adapted the story that featured the Queen herself. Since Harry's family was familiar with the books, it seemed perfectly reasonable to me that they went in that direction, as opposed to simply picking some random celebrity to introduce the story. And I really like Duchess of Loughborough during her sole appearance in the show. In case you're wondering, no member of the Coronation's ever bore that name, so it's very likely that she's a fictional member of her class, which would explain her cream livery and red wheels and different smoke deflectors in Tender. Duchess is very down to earth for someone who has a big responsibility taking the royal train and also makes her a bit scatterbrained as a result. She's a lot like celebrities in real life, far from perfect, and they're no different from ordinary people like you or me. For the first time since her debut in 2003, Emily finally gained the number 12 on her tender in Emily to the Rescue, and the way they pulled it off was completely underwhelming. Did I want Emily to gain a number? Yes. So what was the problem with it? The story was a complete mess. A safety inspection takes place, then an emergency drill takes place, and James, Percy, and Rebecca crash while racing to get Rocky, so Emily is sent to pick him up instead. Meanwhile, a road bridge is on the verge of collapse and Gordon nearly gets into an accident, but then Emily and Rocky save the day, and she's made the official safety engine and the number 12 is painted on her tender. Were you following all of this? This is a random events plot in which barely anything feels connected, and Emily getting her number at the end just feels tacked on with no proper build-up or foreshadowing. Was it worth it for the sloppy storytelling that got her there? No. 
If anything, it makes you wonder why Emily didn't get a number from the get-go. On top of that, why is Emily already the safety engine when you already had Belle? In fact, Belle even had a role this season in Nia and the Unfriendly Elephant, which aired two episodes later. It makes Emily the official safety engine simply redundant in every sense, even more so since many other engines have taken Rocky in the past. So what's the point in making Emily the only engine allowed to take him to emergencies? Emily to the Rescue is not her worst episode, it's much better than Emily's best friend, but not by much, but it is by far her most disappointing as it could have been so much more. Instead it felt like a half-assed attempt to give her a proper role in the show, but too little too late, not at all engines go is focusing solely on Thomas and the smaller engines. They should have gone back to the writing board on this episode and given Emily a proper send-off rather than treating it all like an afterthought. It's like Henry's rebuild into Flying Kipper coming from nowhere, so in a sense, it looks as though we've gone full circle. So how does the final series of the show as we knew it since 1984 hold up? Well, it's pretty good overall, easily the strongest of the Big World Big Adventures era. I mean, there is no episode I rank worse than Apology Impossible or Panicky Percy, but at the same time, it's also frustrating and kind of sad, because after all the crap that Series 21 had to endure just to get this era off the ground, and just as it was finding its footing, Mattel decides to bin it all in favor of a pointless reboot that no one wanted or asked for, rather than actually worrying about getting their stock into stores. As for me, I have no interest in talking about All Engines Go, I'm not even gonna watch it. So who knows what Stoughton and co might have come up with had the format been allowed to continue. Could we have seen Thomas ending up in new countries like Germany, France, and Japan? Feel free to leave your ideas in the comments below, and I'd love to hear them so long as they are NOT comments like Bubba ruined Thomas. I swear if I see another comment like that again... So yeah, Series 24 is one that's frustratingly good, and it leaves you wondering what might have been had All Engines Go not taken place. Before I give my final thoughts on the Big World Big Adventures era, let's take a look back at the previous four eras and see how this era ranks among them. The classic era I found to be pretty good, but far from perfect. The hit model era was a big step down, starting off decently but then bottomed out with a transitional series that's aged pretty horribly. The less said about the nitrogen era, the better. And the burnout era was very much on par with the classic era, even surpassing it at points. So where does the Big World Big Adventures era rank? Somewhere in the middle. Not the greatest thing ever, but when it's good, it's really good. I know that there are a lot of people out there who treat it like dirt, but I have a suggestion for you, however blunt I may come off as. Rather than getting all hung up over that era supposedly not being Thomas, just accept that it happened and move on. If you could do so for series 13 to 16, why not do so for 22 to 24 as well? Something that we always take for granted is that a lot of people poured their hearts into making these episodes, both good and bad. We shouldn't just live our lives by Thomas Tank Engine as if he's the only thing that truly matters, and I know you're probably sick of hearing it, but it's a show aimed at children under the age of six. Always has been, always will be. Lest we forget, Audrey wrote the first stories based around Thomas and his friends to his son back when he was a toddler as bedtime stories. And if you don't like it when Thomas is described as a kid's show, that's on you for getting upset over it. If today's kids like any part of series 22 to 24, and the lessons they gain from it are not harmful in any way, though frankly, Apology Impossible and Pan and Percy should be avoided at all costs, then that should be all that matters, and that's good enough for me. But how will the Big Little Big Adventures era fare? by 2025 for the franchise's 80th anniversary, if it's still around at all. Ask me again in a few years. But for now, as has become tradition by this point, here's my personal top 10 favorite episodes from that era, some of which I consider on par with both the classic and Brenner eras. Number 10, School of Duck. Number 9, Diesel Do Right. Number 8, Confusion Without Delay. Number 7, Sunny Second Chance. Number 6, Wish You Were Here. Number 5, Rosie is Red. Number 4, Hunt the Truck. Number 3, Young Bow and the Tiger. Number 2, Heart of Gold. And number 1, Thomas and the Royal Engine. And of course, here's my personal top 10 least favorites, so as a minor spoiler, don't be surprised by some of the episodes I chose for this list. Number 10, Barukata. Number 9, Emily to the Rescue. Number 8, Seeing is Believing. Number 7, A New Arrival. Number 6, Emily's Best Friend. Number 5, Thomas in the Wild. Number 4, Thomas in the Monkey Palace. Number 3, Thomas Goes to Bollywood. Number 2, Apology Impossible. And number 1, Panicky Percy. 
Alright, so this concludes Sodorama, at least for the main series. If I've been critical at times when it came to my reviews, in fairness, I may have been unjustifiably harsh at certain points, but as a critic, I value honesty over anything else. If you agree or disagree with anything I've said in this 24-part review series, that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, and most of my opinions when it came to certain episodes boil down to caring about the story rather than the visuals and the music. That's one of the reasons why I don't like the Flying Kipper as much as I used to as a kid. Kid. It's an episode I call Spectacle Over Substance, but I do try to be as fair as possible when it comes to reviewing the show, which I cannot say for Thomas's handler since the 1980s. I think that if there was a recurring theme throughout the show's run, it's that the treatment of Thomas and Friends as a show, brand, and franchise has been atrocious. Bert Alcroft, as well-meaning as she was, is very much responsible for the mess that Thomas is in right now. Wilbur Audrey put his faith in an Icarus, the handless creation. It began when Bert introduced Thomas to America audiences through Shining Time Station and starting with Series 3, she ended up catering too much to the American audience. That's also part of the reason why Rusty to the Rescue exists, because Brit apparently thought that kids from the 90s wouldn't understand anything about British culture. Then Audrey died and Brit took too much control of Series 5, and it was only when Thomas and the Magic Railroad bombed at the box office that she had flown too close to the sun and drowned in her biggest failure, resulting in her selling the rights to hit entertainment. 20 years later, Mattel effectively finished the job Brit Alcross started by creating All Engines Go. This cynical attitude and misunderstanding towards Audrey's creation has hardly changed in the past 30 years or so. As for what the future holds for Thomas and Friends, we have no idea. But at the moment, even when the fanbase acts entirely at its worst, at their best, they can create stories that emulate the feeling of the Railway series, the Classic Era, the Brenner Era, or a combination of all three. So while the true legacy of Thomas will live on in fan projects, I'll leave a few examples below. Of course, no one can truly replicate Wilbur Audrey's writing style or David Mitten's directing skills. Not even Andrew Brenner, Ian McHugh, Diana Basso, and Michael White. But doesn't mean we can't try. Even if All Engines Go flops hard with critics and fans, I do not believe it'll be the worst thing that Mattel has done. Far from it, in fact. They've done far more scandalous things like lying about their stock and sales, supporting Autism Speaks, and more recently, abusing members of the Thomas Creator Collective, many of whom have since gone on to make far better fan productions. A lot of stories that some of those people have told were really fucked up, believe me. Seriously, if those behaviors are not enough to make you hate Mattel, then I don't know what will. Most companies do shady things solely for money, no matter how much you may end up hurting people, directly or indirectly. With all that said, you have to wonder what might have happened had Brit Alcroft not let Thomas's popularity get the better of her and she started to make stupid decisions, again being the indirect cause for Mattel's meddling of Thomas and friends. But as much as I hate to say it, what's happened has happened. The original show was a good run while it lasted. 36 years is a very commendable run if I do say so myself. If they have an online presence, I recommend following the creators to see what they've been up to outside of Thomas and friends. Whether or not you think their contributions to the show were good or bad is irrelevant. There is, after all, more to them than simply writing, producing, or doing voice work for the little blue tank engine and his friends. Maybe ask a few questions if you're interested, but please don't make them all about Thomas. I cannot stress that enough. My name is Zach Wanzer, you've been watching Sodorama, and I'll see you next time when we return to the Emotions Corner. But depending on what crops up, don't expect our next project to be a Thomas-related review. That's not to say we won't revisit the little Bluey 2 and his friends on occasion, but there are other topics we'd like to discuss as well. To give off one final hurrah to Thomas and friends as we know it, here's Headmaster Hastings with a song dedicated to Sodor. Picture a land where the sky is so blue Storybook land of wonder Magical island just waiting for you Island of Sodor will make your dreams come true Imagine a place where the sun always smiles The valleys are green as can be the friends that you love are waiting for you. Island of Sodor, make your dreams come true.
the road that leads to your dream. Over the hills and mountains, look for the skies with stars in their eyes. Island of Sodor will make your dreams come true.